Good afternoon. My name is Matt Abbott, and I'm the Director of Government and Diplomatic Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you all, especially our members, for joining us via Zoom for today's On the Record program. If you'd like to engage with today's speaker, please visit CCGA Live, or, I'm sorry, CCGA.live, where you can submit a question or vote for your favorite questions. As a reminder, the Council is a nonprofit, independent, and nonpartisan platform. The views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. It's now my honor to introduce today's guest. Samuel Wells is a Cold War Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. At the Wilson Center, he founded the International Security Studies Program in 1977 and directed that program until 1985. Since then, he has served as Associate Director and Deputy Director of the Center while also serving as Director of West European Studies. Copies of his recent book, Fearing the Worst, How Korea Transformed the Cold War, are available to purchase by our partner, the bookseller, and a link is available on the event page for this program. Dr. Wells, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. To start off, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the commencement of formal hostilities in the Korean War, which is often referred to as the Forgotten War in the United States. Can you set the stage for us by providing some context about the origins of the war? Oh, this is a question that is very much alive in South Korea and probably in the North, although we know less about that. Uh, the argument still circulates that the South Koreans started the war. And this is uh, a product of both Soviet and continuing North Korean propaganda. But there are some around the world who choose to believe that and when you're dealing uh, with the subject with a large number of Koreans, you have to specify very clearly how it started. I tend to divide the origins issue into context and immediate causes. The context was that the Soviet Union had tried to prevent the creation of NATO, tried to prevent the creation of a separate West Germany, had failed and then turned to Asia to see what it could do there and take advantage of the fact that the United States was withdrawing military forces and setting out a new strategy, which did not appear to include South Korea. Uh, at the same time, the Russians were undergoing very difficult negotiations with the new Chinese leadership, which had just declared the creation of the People's Republic of China Mao Zedong was in Moscow and frankly giving Stalin and his colleagues quite a hard time before he would come to an agreement. Now the more immediate context is that Kim Il-sung, the North Korean leader, had been installed by the Soviets and from the very start had the ambition of unifying Korea under communism. He requested support and endorsement of this proposal from Stalin numerous times, at least a dozen, perhaps 20. Uh, Stalin always said no. And suddenly on January 30th, 1950, in the midst of his negotiations with Mao, Stalin sent a cable in response to another request from Kim saying, now the conditions are ripe. I will support your request. Please get in touch. So what had changed? Stalin, who many in the West thought was at this point being uh, quite ill and not fully in charge of his capacities, had come up with a new concept of how he could advance Soviet interest in Asia. The concept required him to make concessions to Mao give Mao what he wanted, in effect, and put him in his debt. Say yes to Kim, you can do the invasion, we'll help you with supplies and guidance. And secondly, to tell Kim that in order for this invasion to proceed, he had to have the approval and support of Mao and the Chinese communists if he got into trouble. That was his 
in effect, reinsurance policy. So when, after a spring of rearming and supplying and helping the North Koreans draw up plans, the Soviets approved an early start to the invasion, which occurred uh, June 25th, 70 years ago. Thank you. You mentioned some of the central actors in the conflict. Can you tell us what new insights did you gather during your research on Stalin, Mao, Kim, and Truman? Well, I, I gathered quite a lot, uh, and it was sufficient to make me change the interpretation that I had developed over 30 plus years of working in these issues. My initial had thought had been based on Western records, which I had the opportunity to see working for a time as a consultant in the Pentagon on a classified study about the origins of the Soviet American arms race. My view had been, and the view of virtually all Westerners was that the uh, Soviets were planning this as a probe of Western will, and they would see how far they could go. And we didn't understand that Kim was the initiator. Stalin was uh, a somewhat reluctant supporter and that Stalin had offloaded the ultimate responsibility for the success of the operation onto Mao. So uh, Stalin had quite a crafty plan because there was every reason to expect the United States wouldn't intervene. And the, the United States changed everyone's prior assumptions and plans as a result of Truman's very instinctive decision to intervene. Thank you. Now, 70 years on, what would you consider to be the war's greatest political, diplomatic, and military legacies? Well, in perhaps the, the first one that has to be mentioned, and perhaps the most important, is that you have a democratic, open and thriving economy in South Korea. None of those qualities would have applied had the United States done nothing. Uh, all of Korea would be under communist rule and Japan would be under even greater threat than it is now from North Korea. Uh, that's not only a significant accomplishment for the United States, it in the process led to a major arms buildup because the, when the Chinese intervened, it became a matter of great anxiety, indeed fear, that's where my title in the book comes from, that they were on the verge of a possible World War III with uh, a mistaken air attack by Soviet piloted aircraft, by Chinese uh, having greater success than we thought was possible in driving us off the peninsula, which they almost did, uh, and so forth. So that's what stimulated the buildup. And the buildup, in fact, is what reshaped the Cold War. And just for one example, is what provided the naval and air power and the intermediate range missiles which take years to produce and test, that allowed the United States, along with its new submarine fleet with missiles of their own, to stand down the Cuban Missile Crisis when the Soviets had put uh, medium range nuclear missiles into Cuba. So those are among the larger uh, legacies, but in the process of this military buildup, the United States changed the whole posture of the defense of Europe. NATO had been created in 1949, but was on the outbreak of the war, no more than a political reassurance instrument for the nervous West Europeans. With the outbreak of the war, and our estimate that Soviets, the Soviets were prepared to take very large risks. We 
persuaded the Europeans to change with us the nature of NATO into a really functioning defensive alliance. We sent four additional American infantry divisions to Europe. We created a functioning international staff for the alliance. And we named Dwight Eisenhower the commander who led the Allies to victory in Europe during World War II as the Supreme Allied Commander for Europe. So the, 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 the legacies of the war are really quite substantial. And uh, to this day, the Germans and the Koreans in particular, but other Europeans and Asians as well, and Japanese these days, are well aware of that. The history is much more alive for them than it is for us with uh, our increasingly short memories. Thank you. Uh, going back to some of your research for the book, how have documents from archives in the former Soviet Union and other countries shaped our understanding of the Korean War? Well, I would say in a nutshell, they've reshaped it because it was those communist archive documents starting with the opening of Russian archives in 1992-93 after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then the ability of researchers at our center, the Wilson Center, to persuade the Chinese to open their archives and share material so that we could have a joint publishing and declassification process. Uh, on the basis of those sets of records and some others, such as the Albanian archives, Albania, most people would not know, was the Chinese communist best friend in Europe. And the Albanians had a great archive filled with uh, Chinese reports and the Chinese things from the embassy being shared with the foreign ministry. Um, we had the full run of the Albanian archives and uh, it was actually that access that allowed us to say to the Chinese, we have part of your story, we're going to tell it, but it would be a lot more useful for us and probably for you if you contributed the rest of the story, which we knew the Chinese were proud of. We knew they saw the Korean War as a big success for themselves. And so uh, we persuaded them and ended up with a joint project on the Geneva Convention, which was the basic international recognition of the legitimacy of the People's Republic of China. And when the book was introduced, the uh, Chinese foreign minister asked that we delay the opening of the book so he could be in Washington and make the presentation. So um, that was an important start. And it, it, it's caused many studies to rewrite all kinds of aspects about the war. Through the access to these archives, which has really reshaped our understanding of the war, what in your opinion are still some of the biggest misunderstandings that we have about the war and its legacy? One, I think, has to do with the role of General Douglas MacArthur. Uh, MacArthur had in the media and in a certain wing of the Republican Party, a very important vocal and well-connected, at least to the media, uh, group of supporters. And MacArthur and his staff, and then these supporters re-echoing their arguments, contended that if he had been left to fight the war he wanted, he would have not only been able to conquer all of Korea and cold it, he would have been able to knock out and do serious damage to the Chinese communists and perhaps overthrow them. Uh, that's about as uh, inflated a statement as one can imagine from a man who was noted for hubris, but um, there it is. And it's been echoed and echoed because what MacArthur wanted to do was 
bomb and use atomic bombs. He had a, a war plan that would have called for the use of numerous nuclear weapons against Soviet bases in Manchuria and against Chinese cities and industrial points. That really would have led to World War III. And uh, Truman said, absolutely not. And when MacArthur started complaining and speaking to the press and then sent an open letter to the uh, speaker of the, the Republican leader in the House of Representatives who in, included this in the congressional record, uh, Truman fired him. So uh, that that sort of echoes uh, now, and you can the, the the one of the core groups supporting MacArthur were people known as the China Lobby, people who still wanted to support uh, the man known then as Chiang Kai Shek and his nationalists who had been driven off the mainland onto Taiwan, and these people wanted to support uh, Chiang and his efforts to invade the mainland, which would have been really <laughs> a very crazy thing to do. But um, they, they, they had an ideology that this was the solution to America's control in Asia. We were going to have a condominium with Chiang Kai-shek, and that would keep us going for generations. Um, that fortunately was not something that the leadership of the Truman administration would consider for a moment. Thank you. As a reminder to our audience, if you have any questions for Dr. Wells, please submit them at ccga.live. Uh, turning to our next question, um, how specifically did the war shape the relationship between the United States and two major world powers, then the Soviet Union and now Russia and China in the decades following the war? Well, it, it led to, this, let me put, not deal with them separately, but the, the, the Soviets in the Korean War, in the assessment of most Western scholars and I think a number in Asia, uh, were the big losers in the Korean War. They made a gamble. They invested huge amounts of uh, finance, military assets, and human resources into the war, and they lost. Uh, not only did they lose, but the way in which they held back supplies for the North Koreans. And I tried to keep the Americans bogged down at the expense of the North Koreans and the Chinese, in fact, led to the North Koreans being very suspicious of Moscow and laid the seeds of the Sino-Soviet split, which would come later in the 50s. So, uh, that's one of the things that uh, really influenced the relationship. And only after the United States backed down the Soviets in Cuba, and we went through a period of arms race and the United States had this heavy years long involvement in Vietnam and we finally got into talking about arms control in the late 1970s. That led to ultimately putting a cap on the nuclear arms race and trying to come to a fairly uh, workable arrangement to keep the peace, but to compete at an economic and political level in other areas of the world, like Latin America, with the continuing Russian support of Castro, and in Africa, where they had large numbers of troops, and the Cubans helped out in Angola and other places. So uh, there was a, a competition, but it was there was a hotline, there was communication, uh, things worked. And then, of course, the Soviet economy was going down the drain all the time. So. Uh, basically, that's what did in the Soviet Union. 
in large part. So with China, uh, there was a very hostile relationship for a long time until at Nixon's initiative with Kissinger working the, the details and the negotiations, uh, there was this opening to China because was the relationship between Beijing and Moscow had become quite negative. So we offered the, the Chinese an alternative to having relations only with the Soviets and a few other communist countries. So uh, it was a very shrewd move, which restructured the relationship with China and gra gradually improved so that after Mao's death, uh, they went through a type of economic reform, which led them increasingly to be less and less communist in their economics. And they moved toward the start of an industrial economy, which uh, we're seeing a mature form of today. Thank you. What lessons can policymakers today learn from the legacy of the Korean War that are relevant to recent efforts to engage in diplomacy with North Korea? That's complicated by something I'll get to in the end, but lessons that have been learned and acted upon by a number of administrations is how important the U.S. commitment is to South Korea uh, and how we can't make any progress in dealing with North Korea without the South Korean full support. Um, this has extended from the period when the North Koreans were doing commando raids and even an attempt to assassinate the president of South Korea uh, on to the president, which is essentially sort of a nuclear standoff with the North Koreans. Uh, Another lesson that could be learned is that the military side of things is never the solution to a big problem like this. There has to be a political engagement that puts all the pieces on the table and works out some kind of accommodation. Uh, we didn't learn that quickly enough ourselves and went through Vietnam, ended up with a somewhat uh, hasty and uh, damaging withdrawal. And uh, only much later, several decades later, did we come back to a political and economic uh, rapprochement, as it were, with Vietnam. Uh, another lesson which is, I think, important is that Korea, in a way that is not available in many other crises, because in this the Korean War crisis now, we can tell young military officers and young diplomats the story from all sides. And you don't have many cases in recent international relations where that's the case. Normally, you've got your side. You may know a little bit about the others, but not much. Now we can go behind their rhetoric and understand much of the thinking behind their decisions, and that's very important. And uh, so the, the need to have this fine understanding of the interconnection of all these things, of the mistaken assumptions of the various things is, is very important. And has been finally very absent from the current administration. The opportunities were there with the young North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, to make some progress. He had gone ahead in a period of our neglect to develop his nuclear arsenal with considerable assistance from outside sources, primarily the Pakistanis. And his big problem was being recognized as a nuclear power so that he would feel secure. I mean, the primary 
goal of the North Koreans ever since his grandfather founded the regime was surviving as the Kim dynasty. And uh, that was endangered by the terrible economic situation that was affecting the people of North Korea. There was a deal to be made. It probably did not, and I'm certain it did not include the elimination of North Korean weapons. But President Trump, by not doing the adequate preparation, not letting the professionals narrow the issues to the point where he could come in and make closure, jumped in and tried to do it himself without even having full briefings about, much less knowledge, about all of the threads that went into the North Korean position. And in the process, stepping all over the South Koreans at the same time. So what were the lessons that we learned from Korea have now been substantially damaged in the minds of many of our allies and adversaries by the activities of the last three and a half years. So whoever has comes in the next term, whether it's Trump reelected or Biden and a new team, they have a very much more difficult job than someone would have had coming in in 2016 with the mind to have adequate preparation before any summit diplomacy. Thank you. As a reminder to our audience, we'll be turning very soon to your questions, so please feel free to submit those at ccga.live. Um, and one more question, Dr. Wells. Why has the war been termed the forgotten war in the United States, but why is it so actively rem remembered in some of the other countries that participated in it? In part, and very large part, I would say the war is considered the forgotten war by many. Uh, and I must say this is not the case for those who fought in it or those who have studied it closely, but uh, it's viewed by many as a forgotten war because it came very soon after what we have established in our political mythology, for lack of a better term, as the Great War. And uh, people did not know as many of the full stories about World War II and many of the mistakes that were made by the United States and the Allies, because in that war, there was very rigorous censorship. There are large numbers of World War II records that still are not available. Um, we don't have full access to the OSS records. Um, we do have, uh, I mean, we have <laughs> better access to the German records which we captured, those that were survived the bombings, uh, than we do to some aspects of the more secret sides of World War II uh, on the American side. Uh, and primarily, Korea was viewed as an unsuccessful war. Uh, we didn't have total victory. And that was not the goal, because once you feared the start of World War III, the Truman administration adopted a policy of limited war and said we're going to concentrate our resources on defending Europe, which is our primary interest. We will try and fight to a draw and get the terms we want uh, in Korea. And essentially, we did that. At the same time, Truman resisted calls from a number of hardline civilians and General MacArthur for the use of nuclear weapons. So that uh, another aspect that is a very important uh, lesson from that is essentially no first use of nuclear weapons. And that has become not only a policy for the United States, but for most of the countries that are currently recognized as nuclear powers. This does not apply, obviously, to North Korea, which has not been officially recognized. But with the summit in Singapore, they were de facto recognized as 
a nuclear power, and they will certainly pretend to act like one for a long time. Thank you. Turning now to a question from the audience. Um, was there anything you found in the Soviet or Albanian archives that surprised you, especially about Chinese thinking about the war and the Korean Peninsula's strategic importance? <laughs> Quite a lot. Yeah. Um, and I should say, uh, in, in tribute to my colleagues, that a very large number of the records that we found are available on the website of the Wilson Center, but can be reached by going to the internet and putting in digitalarchive.wilsoncenter.org. And you will see clusters of records on the Korean War, on the Soviet role, on Chinese activity, and uh, quite a bit more on Soviet and Chinese policies after the war. Um, what, what we learned was that Mao ran the Politburo of the People's Republic in a, a very different way than Stalin and most other communist leaders did. It was essentially, a, there were two sizes. There was a very, the enlarged Politburo, and then there was what, they, what we would translate as the executive committee. And the, the executive committee was primarily made up of the generals who had with Mao's leadership as the political head won the civil war against Jiang Kai-shek. Uh, he deferred to them. He acknowledged at the start that he didn't know much about economics, and he turned that pretty much completely over to colleagues. He kept some more control himself over military things and the important military commission and had his confidant and very able colleague, Zhou Enlai, serve as the head of the military commission. Now, we'd always thought that the Chinese came in with Soviet pressure when the North Koreans about were about to be driven back across the Yalu and end up in China and China would have really been in distress and that's what brought them in. It's not the case. Mao decided by mid-July, less than a month after the outbreak of the war, that for his own concept of the future of the People's Republic, he needed to intervene in Korea. And he convened the military commission persuaded them to send roughly 600,000 troops to Manchuria to be ready to intervene if needed. And this at a time when the Chinese were, the communists were not in full control of the cities in their own country and of all the northwest of the country, Sichuan and all of the areas infected by the non-hand uh, in uh, residents of those provinces. So uh, Mao spent much of the period from July into early September persuading a few reluctant generals on the executive committee of the Politburo to support his proposal to intervene. And Part of it was dependent on Soviet support and the Soviet guarantee of air support. Uh, even after the Inchon invasion, which occurred in Korean time 70 years ago yesterday, the 15th of September, uh, Mao still didn't have this approval. And Stalin was holding out on him, and this is something he never forgot. So he, he ultimately persuades people to intervene because 
his goal, and he didn't sell it this way. He said, we have to help a friend that helped us in the Civil War. His real goal was the People's Republic has to be the leader of communism in Asia, and I have to be the leader of the People's Republic. So, I mean, that, that, that's a big one. And that comes right out of notes and memoirs and things that have become available uh, since really 2002 or so. Thank you. We have another question from the audience. The audience member is interested in how you conduct your research and specifically curious to hear if you engaged in interviews with North or South Koreans, and if so, if any poignant personal stories came to light. Well, uh, I'm handicapped by uh, limited language abilities in the pertinent languages for this research. And I was helped greatly by a group of able uh, interns who uh, all come to the center to get some experience in research. And the ones who worked with me got uh, some real down and dirty work uh, to do in translating uh, some Soviet cables, uh, Chinese cables, all kinds of things that we had that had not been uh, translated yet. And in going to sources like memoirs, I mean, they, for example, there's a, uh, it turns out, as other scholars have found out, when we get into the Russian, the Soviet records, they were even better record keepers in many ways than the Germans. We always thought the Germans kept the most complete archives. Uh, the Russians recorded all sorts of things. And, uh, you know, the number of people they killed in this um, work camp or whatever. But uh, one of the things they were, they were proud of two things. They were really proud of their capacity to build long range airplanes. Uh, one of the few countries outside the United States that were able to do that. They didn't do it as effectively or as quickly as we did, but, uh, you know, 40% of their country had been destroyed and they lost 20 million people in the war. So they had a little bit of reconstruction to do, but they also did a six volume history of the atomic the nuclear program. And I had the pure luck of getting as an intern a young man who had graduated from the top nuclear institute in Russia, the Kurchatov Institute, and was at Georgetown doing an MBA. And he needed to have a practicum. And I got him working on this six volume history. Uh, so we could go back, for example, and look at who was doing the research what type of instruments they had, what kind of tools they had to make and reinvent, how much graphite, how much uranium they had, uh, et cetera, and compare that with the estimates that have now been published from the CIA of what we, they were estimating the progress would be. Now, our estimate was that it was gonna take the Russians until probably 1955 to have a device and they got it by 1949. And these volumes explain quite in, in, in massive detail uh, how they did it. And uh, espionage is part of it. Uh, they had spies in every aspect of our nuclear program. And the best estimate of the scholars who have been through much more of this material than I have and who are uh, by and large physicists, uh, is that the espionage probably saved the Soviets 18 months. So they would have been mid 51 if they'd done it on their own and they could have done it, but uh, they, uh, they had it in 49. And that's one of the things that made Stalin feel sufficiently comfortable to approve Kim's 
invasion plan and to work this rather complex deal with Mao that looked like it might work out and would be a triple win if it did. But if it didn't, why it was <laughs> a triple problem. And he got the latter. Thank you. We unfortunately have time for only one final question. Um, and going to a question from the audience, given the complicated history between North and South Korea and their current standing, can you share any insights into whether we could eventually anticipate uh, Korean unification? A lot of things will have to happen uh, almost in the right order for that to happen. I think there are many people in North Korea who are not able to express their views who would like that. Uh, almost everyone in South Korea would like it. And the disagreement in South Korea is over the terms, but they require support, most of all, from the United States and China to bring this off and to a secondary degree from Japan. All of these things have to come together. Um, and one of my colleagues who's spent years working in the intelligence community on Korea uh, says she expects this to happen, probably not in her lifetime, and she's in her late 40s, but perhaps in her daughters. So uh, that, that's the best answer I can give, and it certainly won't be within my lifetime. So um, we hope it happens, but a lot of people has got to do the right things in the right sequence. Dr. Wells, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this program has been recorded and will be posted to the Council's website in the coming days. And as a reminder, Dr. Wells' book, Fearing the Worst, How Korea Transformed the Cold War, is available to purchase by our partner, the bookseller, and a link is available on the event page. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Matt.